My name is Francis Moon. I'm a professor at Cornell University in the School of uh, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And this is uh, the second lecture on kinematics of machines and mechanisms. And uh, today we're going to review uh, the material in uh, elementary kinematics of mechanisms and also uh, follow up with some uh, uh, demonstrations of uh, applications of robotics. And then we'll talk about uh, these models, these uh, 19th century models that were made by Professor Franz Rouleau in Berlin. And so the second part of the talk is called Playing with Rouleau's Toys. So, so uh, in the first lecture, uh, we, we talked about the basic idea that if you're going to create a machine, uh, you have to think about how the machine is going to move and how you're going to design it to move in certain ways. And one of the ways in which uh, humans have figured out to make machines uh, move in the right way is to uh, create a whole series of different types of mechanisms. And it's the synthesis of these mechanisms that makes the machine. And it was uh, Franz Rouleau, uh, over 100 years ago, who got the idea that you could deconstruct, uh, you could deconstruct any machine into a set of uh, kinematic mechanisms. So uh, the uh, lecture today is going to talk about uh, a review of links and joints and robots and types of mechanisms, and we'll talk about Bruno's models, and uh, we'll talk about mechanisms for engines, pumps, mathematics, and clocks, and then we'll talk about Cornell's online uh, museum of mechanisms called uh, K-Model. So, so at the last lecture, we talked about, uh, oh, some of this material, as we said in the first lecture, may be found in uh, my book on the, the machines of Leonardo da Vinci in front of you. And uh, it was uh, Franz Rouleau who said that uh, kinematic synthesis is the most important part of mechanical engineering because with it, you will uh, be able to create the, the whole machine. And uh, in the last lecture, we, just, we talked about if you're going to create a new machine, we have to have a language of machines. And part of this language is identifying machine elements, kinematic pairs, kinematic chains or circuits, simple mechanisms, compound mechanisms, uh, machine modules, and then the whole system, such as uh, a jet aircraft or a uh, rocket. And the basic, uh, the basic uh, fundamentals of kinematics have to do with how you put together different uh, uh, rigid bodies and uh, connect them uh, with either uh, revolute joints or with, uh, with uh, prismatic joints, sliding joints, and uh, connecting all of these uh, links with different uh, joints uh, then produces so many degrees of freedom, and with that degrees of freedom then you can produce a machine to do what you want. In these uh, 19th century mechanisms, uh, we basically have one input and one output. So we talk about these machines of having one degree of freedom. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, we'll see in a minute, when we talk about a robot, uh, we want the robot to have uh, at least uh, five or six degrees of freedom. Uh, the other idea we talked about was the so-called kinematic chain, namely that if we, uh, if we uh, link together uh, uh, four of these uh, uh, rigid bodies and connect them with four <coughs> joints, then we have uh, a system with one degree of freedom. And uh, this particular formula here, Grubel's criteria, the numbers of degrees of freedom, is three times the number of links minus one minus two times the number of joints, in this case, revolute joints. And in this particular one here, uh, N is 4 and uh, R is uh, 4. The number, of, the number of joints is 4 and the number of links is 4. And one of the ideas that Rouleau had was that the ground, the, the ground serves as one of the links. 
The other idea, which we talked about in the first lecture, is that we could not only ground this link, we could ground this link or this link. And so from this particular kinematic chain, we could get four different types of mechanisms. Uh, here you see a model for a uh, so-called slider crank uh, mechanism. Uh, here we have three uh, revolute joints, but here we have a, a sliding joint, and of course uh, we would have those in uh, uh, an automobile engine in which uh, this would be the piston and this would be the connecting rod. Again, however, you could fix the piston, you could fix the connecting rod, fix the crank, and get a... Uh, and get a, uh, a different mechanism. And what Rouleau did is he thought of this as a circuit. And the C minus is the, uh, is the, uh, the, the cylinder, the hollow cylinder. The C plus would be uh, the piston. And so each of these, uh, each of these uh, uh, joints here could be thought of as, 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 as two pairs, uh, uh, allowing, allowing it to rotate here and slide here. So. Uh, the other idea is that we could deconstruct uh, the, uh, the machine into different kinematic uh, mechanisms. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, my assistant here, Jeff Lip uh, Lipton, who's a TA in my robotics class. And I just want to show you, uh, here's a uh, Here's a, a, a robotic manipulator arm. This would be a, a small robot arm that would be used in manufacturing. And uh, you can identify a number of different uh, mechanisms. First, you have belt drives here. Uh, these things here are DC motors plus encoders. Uh, then you also have a, uh, if you could rotate this, uh, uh, yes. You have a gripper here, and the gripper uh, has a, a, a parallel mechanism. It's a four-bar parallel mechanism. So over here, this is a, this is a small gripper that was made uh, in my laboratory a few years ago. In fact, it was made by a freshman. And we wanted to have a gripper in which the, in which the sides remain parallel. So if you had a four-bar linkage in which the, the opposite uh, links are, are the same length, then as you move this here, these, this remains parallel, and it allows you to pick up different uh, objects of different size. And this has the same, so this has two four-bottom uh, mechanisms. The other thing that this has is a differential joint here. The differential joint uh, allows you to uh, roll as well as pitch. Maybe you could actuate that. So there's a, there's a, a roll motion, and then by uh, driving these the other way, you could get a pitch motion. This particular wrist does not have any yaw, so it's, it's really a, so we have a, uh, they have a, uh, this motor here, why don't we move this about the, about the vertical axis, that's called a waist motor, so it's very anthropomorphic. This is the uh, shoulder motor here, this is, the, uh, this is the elbow here, and this is the wrist here. So it's like the human, you have uh, a waist, you have a shoulder, you have an elbow, and then you have a wrist. And uh, uh, it's very interesting that the human, uh, if, if all of you grab your wrist here, grab one of the wrists with the other hand, and uh, see how many degrees of freedom that you have, and you see that you can get pitch here, and you can get yaw, but you cannot get roll. How do you get, if you release it, how do you get roll? The forearm, that's right. So there are two bones in the forearm that allow you to get roll, uh, whereas, uh, whereas here, uh, we only have two degrees of freedom. Uh, 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 so this is a five axis machine. And so we can pinpoint the, uh, the wrist in the three dimensional space, and we can only, we can only uh, move the, uh, the object in orientation in two, in two degrees of freedom. So maybe we can just take it through a few of its, uh, of its paces here. So. <coughs> now, of course, uh, all of these machines have a limited workspace. 
So in designing a robot, you have to think about what will be the space in which it's going to work. And uh, then uh, you want to work away from the, the boundaries of that space. And uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, analysis that you would have to do if you were going to design this particular uh, machine. So thank you very much. And uh, we also talked about designing walking machines. And uh, in the last lecture, we talked about that if we had uh, eight uh, uh, links and uh, 10 joints, we would have a numbers of degrees of freedom is, is one. And uh, we could find uh, 12 different combinations of how to create such uh, mechanisms. And uh, we found that uh, uh, there were uh, some, this is kinetic art from, from uh, Teo Janssen. We find this on YouTube. Something called Strand Beast. This is the size of a human. And each one of these uh, here are legs that uh, can walk. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and one of these particular combinations it can be found in that, uh, in that uh, uh, category list of uh, Gruber. This is a uh, realization, this is a CAD uh, model of a realization. Uh, a student named Ryan Wolf worked with me for a senior uh, design project. And he actually built this machine. And each one of these here is an eight-link mechanism. And, uh, Uh, the eight-link mechanism is, is, is uh, here. This is a crank, which is shared with two legs. So this is the leg, and uh, one of the links has uh, three uh, joints here. And uh, we want to design the, the, the lengths of these so that we'll have a, a straight path here and uh, ability to lift up and put the, the leg down. So. We also found that uh, you could have a different combination of eight uh, links. And uh, here again, this is uh, designed from uh, Taiwan, in which uh, the crank moves here. And then you design this so that this is a straight part. This is where the leg would touch the ground. And we found that uh, we had uh, then a model of this famous Chinese walking horse. And uh, let me see if I can get it to walk across. So walking backwards there. So, so. so each one of these um, four legs whoops, uh, is an eight-bar uh, eight uh, mechanism. And there is some evidence uh, in uh, manuscripts from uh, China from at least a thousand years ago that uh, they were able to build some sort of carts that you could gently push on rough terrain. And uh, in the modern, let's see if we have a photograph of a modern, uh, oh, let's get that. So uh, here's, a, here's a modern uh, a computer design walking robot from Professor Lipson's lab at Cornell. And uh, here we have a realization of that. And you see, again, it has, uh, on the, this time it has uh, four links with two each one has two links, so now we have, we have eight links here. And uh, the interesting thing about this is that uh, this is a machine that learns. So this is an example of not only using kinematics, but using something called mechatronics, in which we integrate uh, not only mechanical design and electrical design, but also uh, artificial intelligence. If this machine loses one of these legs due to <coughs> then the other three legs will learn how to uh, continue to walk toward its destination. So this is from the laboratory of Professor Lipson at Cornell University. So. And of course, uh, another laboratory at Cornell is the laboratory of Professor Andy Ruina. And he has created a different type of walking robot one that uh, uses the dynamics uh, as opposed to just pure kinematics. So here, each of these legs is almost like a double pendulum. And uh, so this is an idea that goes back to a fellow named Todd McGear, who also worked with 
uh, uh, Professor Rowena, and they had the idea of using two pendula, uh, uh, sort of inverted pendula, and uh, if we have a slight gray, then this will walk naturally. So unlike these mechanisms here, which these mechanisms here depend on pure geometry, this particular uh, uh, machine depends on the, the laws of uh, Newton. And you can see a little toy version of this here, walking down uh, this. And uh, this is now a uh, larger version. And uh, the robotics lab of Professor Rowena, uh, a few years ago, uh, working with uh, mechanical engineering undergraduates, was able to design this natural walking machine with a little bit of energy in the kicker. And they walked, uh, I think, for about an hour around Barton Hall. They set some sort of a world record for a uh, natural uh, walking machine. So, uh, To get some of the balance, they have other pendula up here, as well as the, uh, the double pendula legs at the bottom here. So. Uh, this machine seems to have a mind of its own, and the graduate student has to give it a little uh, kick to uh, keep it as on its way. So. so this is a different type of robotic machine that depends not only on kinematics uh, of mechanisms, but also depends on uh, uh, the dynamics of Newton's law. But this idea that you can create machines that walk by themselves without too much feedback is kind of radical because this is uh, the, the Honda machine, which costs about a million dollars. It's filled with all kinds of artificial intelligence. But the laboratory of uh, Professor Rowena has shown that you can make uh, these walking machines uh, for a few thousand dollars. Although they're limited in what they can do, they can still walk. Now I'd like to talk about uh, Professor Rouleau. He was a he was trained at uh, the universe, Technical University at Karlsruhe. And uh, one of the ideas here is that he tried to uh, promote the idea that uh, what was important in machines was to look at kinematic mechanisms. And as we saw in the last lecture, kinematic mechanisms change motion from one form to another. So for example, uh, if we look at these uh, uh, gears here, they might, might call them funny gears, that if you, turn the, if you turn the bottom at constant speed, then the top is going at a, a non-constant speed. And you might want to use that in some sort of a manufacturing uh, situation. Uh, so you can change your motion from circular motion to circular motion, from circular motion to linear motion, and so on. And as we talked about, you can also change motion about one axis to motion about another axis. Uh, the basic uh, kinematic mechanisms, and maybe this is one of the questions we'll put on the quiz next week, is that, uh, of course, there are hundreds and maybe thousands of different mechanisms. But uh, the, some of the basic ones are the four bar, the four bar linkage, which we show in this, uh, in this uh, robotic gripper, the slider crank, which is in most engines, belt and chain drives, gear mechanisms, I just went over that, screw mechanisms, and one of the ones here is a universal joint. <coughs> and here, uh, here is a double universal joint, and you can see that this particular universal, the idea of the universal joint is that it can convert motion about one axis and convert it to another axis. And this is, so this is a universal joint, and this is a universal joint here. It's very interesting that, uh, that uh, the application of this to one of, the, one of the consumer products that you may be familiar with was invented by a Cornellian. Does anybody know where you would find a universal joint? Yes? Drive shaft of a car. In a, in a car, yes. And, and the guy that did it was a guy named Clarence Spicer. And uh, he was a sophomore here at Cornell in 1902 and got the idea. And they were driving automobiles by a, a chain and sprocket. And so he got the idea to get rid of the chain and sprocket and use a universal joint. 
And he patented it in 1904, and then started a company called the Spicer uh, Manufacturing Company, and now it's called Dana Spicer, D-A-N-A. -A. So if you look up Spicer on your Wikipedia, you'll see Clarence Spicer. And he wasn't sitting in these seats because we were over in, in, uh, in Simply Hall, but uh, he, he was a Cordellian and got the idea. And maybe he got the idea by looking at this model because these models were on view for the students uh, 100 years ago. So. so the universal joint is a very important, uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, mechanism to uh, understand. So. Now, to go into a little history, and maybe the next lecture we're going to talk about uh, the, the evolution of machines. If we go back to the time of the Greeks, the Greeks had, especially the school of Aristotle, had thought about machines in a different way. They thought of the so-called simple machines, inclined plane, the lever, the wedge, the screw, the wheel, the pulley. And the trouble with this concept of a machine is that it mixes up both kinematics and kinetics. It mixes up motion and forces. And at this time, they didn't even have uh, the, uh, the idea of a law of motion. Uh, and on what, what, what Rouleau did was, was uh, define uh, uh, machines in terms of the motion that they, they change. And he had six classes of mechanisms. One is the crank chain, which, uh, for example, this would be a crank. This is three crank chains here. Uh, this, is very, this, is, this is three four-bar mechanisms here. And uh, you can see that these uh, paddles here turn. Look, it turns. Look, they flip over and turn. So this, this can be deconstructed into three four-bar linkages. And where would you use this kind of a mechanism? Yes? You had to, like lift something up and incline and dump it off, like in a hay bale? That's possible, but uh, the, uh, one of the obvious things is maybe a riverboat. So these could be the paddles, of a because this goes into the water, and then it feathers, OK? But what's a modern application where you have feathering uh, type of mechanisms? Some of the aerospace people. Helicopters, yes. So the same idea that you could have rotary motion and you could feather, uh, feather the blades. Uh, they may not be using four bar, but it's the same sort of idea. Okay. So this would be a crank, uh, a crank uh, mechanism here. The other one was a screw chain. The other is a wheel chain. This would be, this would be a wheel chain. So this is two wheels here. The other would be a cam. The other is a ratchet, and uh, we'll talk about the, the, the idea of a ratchet uh, in the statements. And the other, the other is a pulley or a belt, uh, a belt. So he thought that those were the fundamental classes rather than the simple machines. Now, uh, as we said on the first lecture, almost all of these models you'll find on the website, Kinematic Models for Design Digital Library, uh, this particular website is part of the National Science Digital Library. And the National Science, uh, if there um, are teachers watching this, the National Science Digital Library has all kinds of uh, modules online for teaching science and technology. One of them is uh, Kinematics of Machines at Cornell University. Uh, the Rouleau models were uh, purchased about 250 models for $8,000 at that time by uh, Andrew Dixon White. And uh, uh, he began his collection at uh, Zurich at the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology there. And uh, then when he moved to Berlin, the government provided him funds to make, and he built a collection of about 800 models. A number of people showed interest in these models, and so he had uh, a man named Gustav Voigt from Berlin uh, build about uh, 300 of these models. Uh, they won medals at the St. Louis Exhibition in 1904, and they were sold to both McGill University and Cornell in North America, as well as some of the German universities. 
Unfortunately, the collection at McGill uh, was destroyed in a fire in the early 20th century. By the way, the website, uh, um, uh, so, so the, the modern collections at that in the 19th century were equivalent to what you would have in YouTube. If you want to go see a, how something moves or a video, you go to YouTube. But at that time, the students had actual models they could touch. And it was considered, if you were going to have an important engineering school or science school, you had to have demonstration models to demonstrate the, uh, the, uh, the uh, principles of science or, or engineering. Uh, the other thing about uh, this collection is that uh, this collection was um, uh, designated a mechanical engineering heritage collection by the American Society of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, here's, a, here's a photograph of Andrew Dixon White, who was the first president of Cornell University. He was the ambassador to Berlin, so he got a chance probably to meet Rouleau then. And Rouleau was the ambassador to, uh, to the Philadelphia World's Fair in 1876. And so these guys were not jet setters, they were steam setters. So uh, they were traveling around the world, forming a network. And uh, Thurston was uh, the, uh, uh, the director of, uh, at then was the College of Mechanical Engineering at Cornell. And he was the first president of ASME. And, um, and, and uh, in 2004, we uh, were designated, this particular collection was designated <coughs> as a national heritage. And we've seen some of these models. This is the four bar uh, model. Uh, it's interesting that uh, when, some, when people look at these models, they know they're old models, so they're not used anymore. No, but these concepts are still used today in modern uh, machines. For example, the four bar linkage can be used in biomechanical knee, knee prostheses. So if you have uh, here a femur and the lower leg, Instead of putting uh, some artificial material here to replace the knee, you can put a, a, a four ball with one, two, three, four, and uh, you'll get the same relative motion of the lower leg relative to the femur as you would as if you had some material in here. And this is a particular, if you go online and you type in four bar prosth knee prosthesis, you'll see a whole bunch of companies uh, actually making these types of prosthetics, all based on the four-bar mechanism. Now, Rouleau's contributions to kinematics, he's sometimes called the father of modern kinematics, he introduced the idea of the kinematic pair, he introduced the idea of the kinematic uh, chain, the machine as a, as a set of these chains, and uh, he also uh, tried to develop a, a theory of machine synthesis. So it's, it's sort of the origins of modern design theory. And the course that you're in right now is mechanical synthesis. And he was one of the first to thought about the, the important aspect of mechanical engineering is not analysis. You need analysis. You need your calculus <coughs> and physics. But in the end, you're going to create new machines. Okay? And, uh, that involved uh, synthesis, putting together different mechanisms in the modern world, putting together not only mechanisms, but circuits, uh, electronic chips, and software uh, to create some modern uh, device. The slider crank, of course, uh, we saw before, and it shows up in, this is another set of models that we have at Cornell, uh, which uh, is a cutaway of a, uh, <laughs> Uh, eight-cylinder engine, and each one of these is a slider crank. Uh, then we have the uh, then we have the uh, endless screw, and uh, here we have interesting thing about the endless screw uh, is it goes back at least at the time of Leonardo da Vinci, and the idea here is that you're turning about this axis and producing a motion about this axis. Not only that, you're getting a speed reduction. But it's interesting that when you try to go backwards, and like, as an input-output device, you can, go, you can turn this quite easily, but if you turn, try to turn this, this doesn't turn. So it's almost like a mechanical diode. On the other hand, I have another, I have another endless screw here. Uh, these models were made by the Illinois uh, 
gear manufacturing. I think we got these about 1950. Now, same sort of thing. I've got an endless screw. I can turn it quite easily this way. I'm going to put it down. But if I turn it this way, look. Why is it that this particular endless screw is a two-way device, and why this one here is a uh, one-way device? Any clues? Yes? Are the gears tilted at an angle? Yes. So here you have uh, the teeth are cut at this angle here, and, and whereas this here, the teeth are caught, cut at, uh, uh, along the direction of the axis here. And what happens here is that the friction, uh, when you turn it this way, the friction is broken very easily. But here, the friction gets magnified. Uh, in this particular case here, because of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the teeth uh, being cut at this angle here, uh, we can uh, move this in uh, two ways. So this is kind of a, sort of a lost knowledge uh, that you don't find in uh, modern books. On the other hand, it, it does give, give you a clue as if you wanted to design an endless screw that would uh, lock, then you want to use this particular uh, gear. If you, on the other hand, if you wanted to, to move freely, then uh, you're going to have this sort of spiral uh, teeth. Uh, here is the so-called planetary gear, the, uh, sort of the sun, planet, and ring gears. And we talked about uh, those. As, uh, this type of topology is used in differential. Uh, this is another planetary uh, uh, and, and, and ring gear. The other, the other thing I wanted to say about Rouleau is that uh, I visited uh, Germany and part of his uh, models are at the Deutsches Museum in Munich. And uh, in the Deutsches Museum there's an archive and I was able to get hold of his, his, uh, his, his uh, letters and uh, some of his writings. But I also came across his drawings. And I thought, geez, what beautiful drawings. And he was a proponent of the so-called machine beautiful movement. Today, when we want to make a machine beautiful, we cover it with something. We give it to a so-called designer, and they don't care what's inside. On, on the 19th century, though, they believed that um, they were fascinated with how things move. And so they, they, they uh, created these beautiful shapes. And you see here is a pedestal. This is characteristic of Rouleau's design. And you can see it right here in these pedestals. They all have this beautiful curve here. You can see this beautiful curve here. And uh, of course, it was carried to an extreme. Uh, this is uh, a steam engine uh, that was in the Smithsonian. And you can see here they have a Greek uh, column here on the, uh, as part of the rocker arm for a steam engine. And they had also painted it uh, because they were proud of these, of, of these machines. And they thought they should look in, uh, beautiful. In a way, mechanical engineering was sort of an extension of civil engineering. And civil engineering was closely tied to architecture. And many of the machine engineers of the Renaissance were architects, artists, as well as engineers. And if they were designing a machine, it should look as nice as a building. And so you see this, uh, this uh, nice attention to, uh, to the uh, individual components. And Boulot believed that if you made the object uh, have some sort of a smooth uh, transition from one part to the other, you actually would create a machine that would sort of optimize the stress distribution. So he, had, he was one of the first to think about the idea of form and function. That if you design something that's efficient, it will also be beautiful. Uh, this, of course, is a ratchet mechanism. And uh, I just we talked about the, the four. This is a single four-bar linkage here. Let me say something about that. Uh, I hope we brought that uh, model out. Uh, oh, yes, here it is here. So one of the things that Rouleau did was uh, uh, think 
about whether two mechanisms have the same uh, kinematic uh, topology. And this particular is a spherical engine. When we think of engines, we think of a cylinder with a piston. And in this particular case, this is a sphere. It's a glass sphere. This was made uh, over 100 years ago. And you see there's a wobble plate. See this? Look at, see, I don't know if you can see the wobble. Make me come up. There's a wobble plate here and another plate here. And so this was a spherical engine, and it was made around uh, the 18... Uh, 30s, and it was used in the Houses of Parliament uh, to get some sort of air conditioning or ventilation. It's interesting that, that this topology did not survive. The topology that survived for engines was the cylinder, uh, 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 the, the cylinder uh, type of engine. Recently, uh, uh, these so-called so wobble engines or spherical engines have made a comeback, and uh, there is a, a company out of Cambridge that's trying to create some sort of a, a diesel-like uh, engine based on this uh, spherical engine uh, type. And he figured out that the topology of this spherical engine was the same as the, as the universal joint. So there's the universal joint there. Uh, I'm going to skip the Geneva wheel. And, uh, uh, here is a very interesting uh, machine. Uh, this was one of the first uh, gasoline engines, and of course the name Otto, if you've taken a thermodynamics, you learn about the Otto cycle. But uh, Otto was, uh, was uh, developing a uh, in, uh, sort of internal combustion engine, as in contrast to a steam engine. And uh, Rouleau was on a patent board, the German patent board, and he came across this uh, application for a patent. Uh, but he knew that Otto was, didn't have any money. He was like a, a, an inventor you know, working on his own. On the other hand, uh, Rouleau had a friend named Langen, Eugen Langen, and he, who had money, would, would, would start his own company. So he suggested the two of them get together, and they did and they created this auto wagon gas engine. The competition at that time was a French engine, okay? And, they, and it was a several French engines. And the, 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 the principal one was a man named Lenoir. And there was a Paris exhibition uh, in which there were several of these gas engine, engines on display. And it turns out that Rouleau was one of the judges. Now, he couldn't say, give the prize to my friends. Give the, and he was a consultant to this company, but he could say, how about if we have a contest to see which engine uses the least gas? Well, they couldn't say no to that, right? So they had this contest, and the Otto Langen engine used half the gas, half the gas, than the French engines. Well, the French cried, Oh, they must be pumping something up from the bottom of the floor. So they said, we'll move it outside. So they moved it outside, did it again. And the Otto Langen engine is one piston going up and down here. Won the, the uh, Napoleonic Prize, much to the dismay of uh, Lenoir and other French uh, engine manufacturers. <coughs> As a result, they were able to sell several thousand of these in uh, Britain and the rest of Europe, whereas the French only sell, sold several hundred. Now, this was important because it gave them a few years' capital in which to develop the Otto Four cycle. And again, uh, Rouleau was behind the scenes consultant. So, whenever you hear the name of, of somebody's name on a, on, a, on a patent or an invention, there's always people behind the scenes who are uh, helping or pushing forward uh, these, these types of uh, endeavors. Now, uh, tomorrow I'll talk about uh, the, in the third lecture, I'll talk about the connection between uh, Rouleau and, uh, the, and the engineers of the uh, Renaissance. And in the case of the Leonardo da Vinci, you can see that here's a four bomb, that this is a drawing in the so-called Codex Madrid, there's actually a four-bar mechanism here 
And he also has one, it's an endless screw, look at that. And here is an endless screw is connected to a slider crank. What this is for, I don't know. But uh, there's a drawing. And he also had uh, uh, gear, uh, uh, gear and uh, uh, pinion uh, mechanisms. Here's another uh, endless screw mechanism here. And I'm, I'm going to go on. So the, uh, one, another thing here is uh, Rouleau also uh, developed a series of models for pumps and engines. Uh, this type of fuel pump here is also used in the modern fuel pump here, so is this one here. This is a quite beautiful one here. Uh, we have one uh, right here, which, uh, in which, in which th look at this, isn't this beautiful? Look at this, two spirals, two inv involute curves are rolling one on the other. And these are, in other words, the water would come in here, you trap the water, and you pull, push the water out here. These are so-called displacement pumps. And there's like dozens and dozens of these. And Rouleau was one of the first to, to uh, make a, a catalog and to analyze these uh, different, uh, different pumps. And these could be used as either an engine or as a pump, either way. Right? Now, one of the interesting things that Rouleau worked on was so-called curves of constant width. And here is a... Uh, here is a, uh, I can stop this for a minute. So this is a, 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 a so-called curved triangle, sometimes called a Rouleau triangle. You see this is an equilateral triangle. And if you take this point here and draw an arc there, and then take this point here and draw an arc there, and so on, then if you measure, if you measure the width of this, the width is the same no matter what you do. Amazing. Not only that, he says there's an infinite number of these. In other words, if I have five, seven, nine, I could do the same thing. So these are sort of curves of constant width. And, and uh, let's see, we had a model here. Yes, so that means that you could create wheels which are not circular. See, so this is rolling, but this is not going up and down because the width is the same. The problem is that the motion of the axes is, is moving, so you have to worry about this. Now, one of the things you can do with the Rouleau triangle is that you can create a, if you, put, if you put cutters here, you can create a tool that drills a square hole, right? And if you go and, 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 and there's a company in Pennsylvania that makes a drill that will drill a stale hole based on the Rouleau triangle. So, uh, well, one of the, one of the uh, applications of this type of idea is the so-called Michael engine, although they don't use a square, they use a different shape. Uh, the idea here is that I could have some sort of gas introduced here, an explosion here. This could move this along, and then when it gets over here or over here, you could exhaust that gas. So you could create an engine out of this. Uh, again, a non-cylindrical type of engine. And, uh, uh, Mazda, I don't know whether they still, uh, I think the RX-8, which was several years ago, the Mazda RX-8, I think, had a uh, Wankel engine. Uh, uh, so, and if you read Wankel, uh, Wankel's book, uh, uh, which was translated uh, as of uh, the 1940s, he said that Rouleau was the world's expert at that time on rotary type of engines. And we already saw this. There's the below triangle. And the other application, the other application is to British coins. Uh, so if this is a seven-sided, so here's seven-sided. This is a 50p coin. Again, if you take this vertex here and draw an arc, take this here and draw that arc, and so on, okay? Uh, this will have a constant width, all right? So that if you go in your pocket, you can feel that it's a 50p coin. But if you put it in a slot machine, what's going to happen? If you put a curve of constant width in a slot machine, is the slot machine going to think it's any different than a circular one? <coughs> Nobody's talking. Only some people who say it. It's, it's, it's going to... It's going to behave the same way in the slot machine as the circular coin. 
but you can feel it in your pocket. This is a 20p coin. So the next time, see it's 50, next time you're in uh, London, uh, pick yourself up a 50p or a 20p coin, and then uh, you can have a nice conversation at a pub on, uh, on, uh, on uh, Rouleau Triangle and Cards of Constant Width. Another idea was the idea that you could create, uh, use uh, mechanisms to create various ma ma mathematical functions. This is a very famous one called Poissonier straight line mechanism. Again, it's eight links here. And here you see, this is the mechanism right here. And if you move this in an arc here, this point will go up and down in a perfect straight line. And you get four links here. Five, the, the base is six, seven, eight. This is just the driver, this is just the driver here. And so this is an eight link, uh, uh, eight link uh, uh, mechanism, and it's one of the models in, uh, in, the, in the Rouleau collection S35. <coughs> and uh, we have one of them here that was replicated in uh, Professor Lipson's lab, and you see it right here. So as I turn this, as I turn this here, this point here goes up and down a perfect straight line. Now you say, what's the big deal about a straight line? Well, if I change the length of this link here to this link here, right now these are supposed to be equal. If they're slightly unequal, then this point here will make an exact a, 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 a curve with an exact a radius of curvature. And you say, what's the big deal? I just take a compass. Suppose I want a radius of curvature one kilometer. I could have this draw a radius of curvature one kilometer by just changing the different ratio of these two links here. So that was the idea that you could use mechanical linkages to replicate various mathematical curves. And, um, and, and that was a, a, a big deal in the 19th century. Today we have a lot of we have electronic uh, devices that will do that, but in some cases it may still be useful to develop. Uh, now I'd like to talk about uh, uh, another uh, another set of uh, models that he had were uh, uh, models that that showed space curves. So when something is moving, so if I'm moving my hand, if I'm moving, if I'm walking, I could attach connectors to, I could attach some sort of a uh, extension of my arm, and the tip of those extensions could trace out a whole series of curves. And so what he did was create a set of, of models in which here's, here's Here's a cone rolling on a cone, and as this, as this cone rolls, it traces out these curves. So these are the space curves. And you can imagine that as anything moves, there's a whole, there's a whole beautiful array of these space curves. And you, and you may want to use these space curves for some particular motion by extending the body. To, so that, but it, it does give you, uh, uh, it, it, so as this is, as this is rolling, you see these beautiful curves being tra traced, traced out. And these were, there's about the six or seven models like this that, that show these diff different space curves. Now, let me say something about, uh, let me say something about uh, the uh, website here, uh, uh, Kinematic Models for Design Digital Library. It was a collaboration between uh, uh, mechanical engineering, uh, myself, Professor Hyde Lipson, and mathematics, Professor Henderson, and uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, wife, who's a historian of, of, of uh, mathematics, and the engineering and university libraries. And it was sponsored by National Science Digital Library. And uh, in the first couple of years, it had uh, uh, 200,000 uh, visitors. But in 2009 alone, we've had near half a million visitors to this website. And uh, it's a virtual uh, museum and library. And not only do you have access to 400 uh, mechanisms, 
but you also have various uh, uh, movies and animation, hands-on, and also the mathematics. As I, as I just said, there is a, um, a whole literature on the mathematics of mechanisms. And if you go to the tutor tutorials, uh, uh, there, there are tutorials uh, uh, written on the, at, in K model on the mathematics of mechanisms. The other thing we have is access to rare books in the history of machines, and also the idea that you can print some of these mechanisms. So here is, here is a, uh, uh, a, a picture of a uh, pump from, from the book by Romelli. This is a book that's uh, 1588. And here is the pump here. It's worked by a water wheel. And this is one of the first examples of an exploded view. And you can see that there's a uh, sliding vein uh, here, which were used. Uh, so here's, here's, here's one of the models here with a sliding vein type of pump. So if, if you have to build a, a model for this, I, I, in the past years, uh, Cornell students built a, a model of a pump. Uh, the sliding vein goes back to uh, the Renaissance. And it turns out that Cornell has an original of Romelli's uh, book, and students can go read the original, li original book in the Rare Books Library. And please take advantage of this while you're here sometime uh, to go down in the basement of the Olin Library and ask to see Romelli's uh, book on, uh, on, on machines. Now, this book has been scanned with 50 other rare books. So you can see these books online. And uh, all over the world, uh, people are going to this website to uh, look at uh, uh, some of these books. Now, you don't have to read Latin or, or German or Old English or French because they're filled with beautiful drawings of machines. And, and, and this is uh, one, another one of the pumps that's illustrated. Uh, it's a vein pump here. Uh, I thought, I, oh, here it is right here. So. Again, uh, you bring water in on one side, and, and, uh, and this goes back to the Renaissance, OK? Yes. Uh, so finally, uh, I'd like to say that the other thing that you can do with this website is to uh, reproduce. So this is the slider. Okay? You, can, you can find code at the website which you can um, turn into a model of uh, using a rapid prototyping uh, machine. So, and uh, finally, I'd like to say that uh, besides uh, the fascination with machines as what they can do, machines can also be uh, thought of as kinetic art. And uh, if you look closely at some of these models, uh, you can uh, see the beauty in uh, the motion of these, uh, these machines. And uh, fi finally, I'll quote uh, Chebyshev, who said, uh, take to kinematics, it will take you into the fourth dimension. So thank you very much for your patience.